My name is Shinya Inoue. Um, I'm going to start off by showing you a movie that I took and then explain what the movie means as we go along. Here we're seeing a dividing pollen mother cell of an Easter lily, and the movie is showing uh, structures that uh, people had not seen inside living cells before because people had, scientists had been fixing cells in order to visualize those structures if they could see them. And here we see the uh, fibers pulling chromosomes apart and then fiber new filaments appearing between the separating sets of chromosomes and laying down a cell plate. And uh, the significance of all this is that um, by l looking at the living cell, we can not only tell where the fibers are and what they are doing, but tell what the molecules are doing inside them. Especially what I'd like to talk about is about how cells divide and what we found out about how molecules come together or fall apart and how this plays a very important role in terms of how cells divide. Now, so how did this whole thing happen? Well, it happened because I met uh, Professor Katsuma Dan. Uh, he, he was a very unusual teacher because he had taken his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and had come back to Japan in 1937 with his American wife. And then uh, I was in the first class that he ever taught in Japan. And what he did was to, uh, was so different from the uh, other Japanese high schools that I attended. He even let us um, not um, do experiments that he had prescribed for us, but let us try things that were of interest to us in the lab. And so what I did was to try uh, Lily's iron, wa iron wire model of nerve conduction. And this was such an interesting project that this really got hooked me into biology. And then a few years later, when I met Katie at his and Jean Dan's home, uh, he showed me this book, which is on the right-hand side. This was by W.J. Schmidt in Gießen, Germany, who had a picture that's shown in the middle. Those were of sea urchin eggs, in which you see these bright or dark structures. Uh, Schmidt thought that those were chromosomes when he wrote this book. But in 1939, he revised his view and said those were actually um, mitotic spindles. So this is of interest to us, and especially to Kasuma Dan, because Dan thought that the spindle elongating was what was responsible for what divided cells. So he said, let's try and repeat this experiment of Schmidt's. And we tried once in the dark, but didn't work after the war we got back together in Misaki at the Marine Biological Laboratory after he recovered it um, from the Occupation Army. And I built this, this microscope, um, which is a porizing microscope, somewhat different from what is used in mineralogy. And this has very good extinction porizer and analyzer and a compensator and so on. Very bright light source, which makes it easier to see the uh, various things inside living cells. And so using this, we were able to see images somewhat better than what W.J. Schmidt saw, and we were able to follow what was going on inside dividing cells. So this is what started me on the whole quest for following living cells and asking with the porizing microscope, um, what are molecules doing inside yourself? Now, the uh, microscope that is shown here is what I built when I came to Princeton in 1948 as a graduate student. And with the microscope, uh, I was able to show uh, what uh, part of the cell was birefringent. Birefringence is a word I'll keep on using. That means it has different optical property than the rest which you can see by using porous light microscopes. And um, by using 
porous light, not only can you visualize the structure that is birefringent, but the birefringence tells us how molecules are lined up, how they change, and so on. Uh, so this is the special kind of microscope I built for that purpose. Uh, now, uh, with that, what I was able to do was to, first of all, show that uh, in dividing cells, there were actually fibers that are pulling chromosomes apart during cell division. And this was important because when I first came, it was uh, argued back and forth, even though many people had studied cells in after fixation, that uh, the uh, cells may not have been quite happy or alive. And so we needed to find a condition where the cells were alive and still see the fibers that pull the chromosomes, and those were not visible except by using porized light. And the porizing microscopes that were available then were not good enough to show the details. So this is why I built the microscope. Now, what we see here, the bright structures are the birefringent spindle fibers, which had been thought to be present but not necessarily proven. And those are pulling the chromosomes apart and after the chromosomes are pulled apart, then you see thin filaments, which in the case of plant cells, lay down the cell plate, and that divides the cell into two. So after seeing this, even the skeptics could not argue anymore that these were artifacts of fixation, but were really present inside the living cells. That was fun enough as it was, um, but what was really interesting to me was to find out that these birefringent structures were not just there to move chromosomes and so on, but had some very intriguing properties. Um, they would come and go. Here's a dividing sea urchin egg, which is about to divide, and you see the birefringent spindle in the middle. But now I'm going to drop the temperature, then raise it again, drop and raise it. And as you see, this is a time-lapse movie, but each time I drop the temperature, then the birefringence just, just whoosh, disappears. What it means is that the molecules are not bound there together tightly, but can fall apart very easily, again, dropping the temperature. And this doesn't affect what the cell does. It's perfectly happy and keeps on going. Drop the temperature, raise again. So it can, we can keep on doing this experiment over and over again. This tells us that the molecules that make up these fibers are in a dynamic equilibrium with something they can either fall apart or be put together again. And we'll see more of this in the next slide. Um, here what we see is the effect of colchicine. This is a well-known drug for, known from the uh, Egyptian tomb even, uh, which was used for treating gout. But more recently, it's been used for collecting chromosomes because one can collect metaphase chromosomes and use uh, this for diagnosing how chromosomes, whether they are normal or not. Now, what happened with colchicine is when I applied colchicine to living cells, in this case, it's a uh, uh, oocyte, the cell that forms an egg of a marine worm Ketopters. Um, these are my favorite material because the cell stays in metaphase unless you stimulate it to go further. So it has a metaphase spindle built in. But then when you apply colchicine, then as you saw in the, see in the lower row, the birefringence gradually disappears in a few minutes. And then if you use a lower concentration, then as you see in the upper row, then not only does the birefringence disappear, but the spindle gets shorter and shorter and shorter, and at the same time <clears throat> pulls the chromosome to the cell surface. So from this, I concluded that uh, colchicine is one of, just like coal, is one of the agents that make the uh, spindle material fall apart. But that what is interesting is as the molecules are falling apart, they can generate force for pulling. 
And this is a very strange concept that you can make pulling force, generate pulling forces that would pull chromosomes and an inner spindle pole to the cell surface. And then if you take the colchicine away, the reverse happens. The molecules come back together and it pushes the chromosomes and the inner pole towards the middle. So this gave rise to the whole concept that molecules that are falling apart can actually generate pulling forces. Now, this seemed so strange. So it took 20 years until uh, in the test tube this was proven to be correct. One other graduate student working with us, uh, Art Four, uh, did another experiment. He used a small spot of ultraviolet, oops, of ultraviolet light, as you see in the top second to the left uh, panel, a bright spot of ultraviolet light. When you shine a bright microbeam of ultraviolet light on the spindle and watch the biofringence, then you see that spot, spot itself lose the biofringence and develop an area of reduced biofringence, ARB, as you see there. What was really surprising is that this ARB then gradually migrates to the spindle pole and then disappears, which means that there must be some movement of material, the spindle material, from the chromosomes towards the spindle pole. And while this is going on, the part between the chromosomes and the ARB, and between the ARB and the pole, the biofringence doesn't change, which meant that there must be a biomicrotubule organizing center both at the chromosomes and at the spindle poles. So this was quite a revolution, a revelation. And when we put all of this together, then as uh, Ted and I put together in a summary article later on, um, the spindle has organizing centers both at the spindle poles and right at the chromosome kinetochore. And then those are both responsible for lining up the microtubule material, tubulin. But the tubulin is constantly flowing from the chromosomes towards the spindle pole. And as Tim Mitchison and others showed later on, this occurs very, very rapidly. Um, but in spite of this, then if we apply cold or colchicine or hydrostatic pressure, then this whole equilibrium is shifted towards depolymerization. So in spite of all this flowing and so on taking place, we get a shorter spindle and the microtubules fall and form tubulin. Again, this is completely reversible. So we have a dynamic equilibrium between microtubules which are flowing from the chromosomes towards the pole and then which can be made to fall apart or come back together. So this forms one of the major current concepts of how spindles work. Of course, there are protein motor, protein, motor protein molecules in addition to this, which also play important roles. And um, as people have found out recently, even at the kinetochore itself on the chromosome, there are 40 different uh, protein molecules that are organizing the spindle uh, microtubules. So the whole story gets more and more complex and is not as simple as I portrayed it initially. But nevertheless, the whole general scheme seems to hold. And finally, as a summary reflection, uh, a polarized light, and I didn't get a chance to talk about video microscopy, but both of these combined together have allowed us to probe the dynamic behavior of cell architecture and the structural molecules, which are far smaller than the resolution limit of the light microscope. And we could do so directly and non-destructively in living cells. Of course, there are other non-destructive methods these days, but <clears throat> these are especially powerful approaches. And still, I believe that we've only scratched the surface. Now I look forward to further developments based on uh, keener insights into the interaction of polarized light, which is an electromagnetic wave with matter, and be 
uh, broader biological exploration through which distinct living cells, which may not be ordinarily used, can teach us ever finer mechanisms underlying the mysteries of nature and of life itself. So this is my summary reflection. Thank you very much for listening.